filmography is back and just in time for Halloween season, we're taking a deep dive into the master of horror, John Carpenter. Starting September 27th, host Dominic Suzanne Mayer and a rotating panel of guests will break down each of Carpenter's 20 feature-length movies to date with new episodes every Thursday. Grab your synthesizer, your flares, and your best Shatner mask and come along on this latest journey with us. Consequence Podcast Network. Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Take a second before we get started to hit the subscribe button so you can keep up with all of the interviews that we put out every single week. That's whether you're listening uh, now on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts from, or even on YouTube. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest, Bruce Watson of the band Big Country. We're going to head back in time to 1988 to talk about their record, Peace and Our Time. This is a record that stands against a lot of the other records from the band's catalog. For better and worse, the sound, it's a very 80s sounding record. We're going to talk about how they ended up with that, these big uh, anthemic songs, and the environment that surrounded the album, including going to Russia at a time where bands weren't going to Russia. It's also some talk about how one of my all-time favorites, Mary Clayton, guested on the record. It's Kyle Meredith with Big Country. Hi, Kyle. How are you doing? I kind of want to head back to 1988, if you don't mind. I noticed that the Peace in Our Time record was turning 30 years old this year, and it's a record yeah. that doesn't get talked about uh, a whole lot, so I was uh, I was hoping you'd head back in the time machine with me a little bit. Oh, okay, don't always do that. It sounds good. <laughs> It's an interesting album, too, because so I, I didn't hear it when it first came out. You know, I, I heard it years later. I didn't have yeah. the context of what was going on, you know, how the fans felt about it at the time. But it was always a really strong album to me. It's it's really not how history's treated it, though. And how do you feel about it these days? We'll, we'll start with the easy question. You know, I still go. It's, you know, it's like a, it was a transition period for us because we had... Um, a new American label, uh, Warner Brothers uh, Reprise label, and they got us out to record it in Los Angeles, um, whereas all our other records were done either in England or Sweden, or the demos done in Scotland. So we prepared a lot of demos for this album, and we went out there to work with um, a producer called Peter Wilf, who's an absolute genius. But when he got the demos, he kind of he ripped them apart and <laughs> re redid them. Uh, it was all so that period in the 80s when um, the St. Claude and the computers were kind of and sampling was, you know, quite heavy, whereas we were always more of an organic band. It does kind of sound a little bit dated because of the recording techniques, but, it, you know, it was great at the time. I think, I think the songs are great, um, and the actual demos were, were great, but they were recorded really organically, yeah. whereas they were just, just a bit too 80s sounding <laughs> on the record, you know. <laughs> It does sound like, though, the, the songs, I don't know if it's production or the type of song that it is, but it does sound like you all were trying to to write songs that would be heard in, in bigger rooms. Is that the way they were meant to be from the beginning? Um, well, we, we certainly didn't think that. Maybe the record company had maybe had a, another agenda. We could have said, you know, make them sound this way or kind of, you know. So we, we, we can only play how we play live. You know, when you get four guys that play the same instruments in a, in a room, um, you're going to get a kind of similar result. And I think maybe Peter had been given, like I say, an agenda by the label to make, make us sound a bit, I don't know, American sounding, I guess. I don't know. Um, and so it was just so different to what we'd done before. It is interesting, you know, because we've heard that story uh, a lot, how the record label gets sometimes over-involved in the creating of art and how that can, you know, I mean, there are good stories yeah. where it worked out well, and there are other stories where it yeah, doesn't work definitely. out. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, we, we, we record an album and then we go out and tour the album and behind the scenes a record company can be back home getting it remixed by other people and you don't have any say over the matter because you know it's actually a way out touring, you know. Right. right. So it's they, they basically the label owns it. They can do what they want with it, you know. Within a, within a certain certain degree. I, I'll bring up to, to that. I, I didn't know this until recently, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys had Mary Clayton singing the background vocals on King of Emotion. That's right. That was absolutely amazing. 
Yeah, how did she get involved, and, and were you there with her when she did it? Yeah, we watched her doing it, and she was telling us all these great stories about it when she did Sympathy for the Devil with, with Mickey and Keith when she was pregnant. It was absolutely amazing. She was still, I think Mick was holding us, her belly in. <laughs> yeah, she was fantastic. Um, we had a, a few things with um, uh, Peter's wife, Ina. She did um, backing vocals, and I think Peter had worked with... Um, uh, Mary before on certain things and he just suggested them. She came in and it was like, wow, this is, we've got a legend in the studio, you know? You know, so the band had been around for, you know, eight, ten years, whatever that was at this point, somewhere in there. But I was I was kind of wondering about the state of the band too because usually this is the part where the the gang mentality starts to splinter, you know? You, you start having your own lives and, and it becomes less about the gang and more of the band as a job. And I, I I don't know, did it ever feel like it got to that point for you all? No, because then the four of us were away from home, we were all in it together. And we, we, we all kind of generally got on well with each other, and hung out socially and stuff like that. So, um, no, it was, we were in a different country. We were in, we basically, we were in Hollywood for about three months, which was um, a complete culture shock to us. I mean, we'd played there before, but we never lived there before. So it was just, we just got kind of caught up in that whole L.A. scene, which was absolutely fantastic. It was great fun. I loved it. Well, of course, you know, speaking of places, I think that's the other part of this story, too. The other part of Peace in Our Time is is Russia, which seemed to be a big part yeah. of that year. I recently saw that documentary, uh, you know, that, that kind of existed at the time. This was uh, recount why this was important because you all were one of the first, right? Well, I mean, I think status quo had been out um, along with I think Billy Joel had maybe been out there, and a few few other bands had. We were not actually the first. There'd been a few bands out there. I think Elton John possibly as well. Um, so I think we were probably about fourth in line. <laughs> uh, and it was just it was just a it was a mad year because we spent you know the, the, a good few months in Hollywood. And then the record company, the British label, sent us down to Australia to do a couple of videos. And then we launched it um, at the Russian embassy in London. And they went to Russia, so it was probably the, the most expensive year the bands ever <laughs> had. <laughs> you know, I think we're, we're still playing these days. Yeah, but I, I, I guess the part of the story I understand is, you know, a lot of those artists that you had you had kind of mentioned before, they. You know, there were governments working to get them there, and and the unique thing about having big country come into it, it was it was more promoter driven, more independent of the government and everything yeah, to have yeah, you all done, there. Done, yeah, I mean, we still had to jump through a lot of hoops, and there was a hell of a lot of red tape. I mean, a lot of I don't know um, what went down because it was just you know admin and red tapes. So I do know that it was a quite a lengthy process for the management and the promoters to to, to make it work. You know. How was that, though? How was that being in a place that had kind of been shut off from the rest of the world, that obviously there was a lot of uneasy mystery that involved in Russia, not unlike what we're going through right now? Yeah, it was um, It was definitely a culture shock. You know, sometimes you just got to roll with it, and you have to accept things that are out with your control, you know? I wouldn't say it was the, the, the greatest of times. It was definitely a kind of achievement for um, the management, the label, and promoters to pull something like that off. Um, but we as a band, we didn't really get involved apart from kind of turning up and um, performing. The, you know, those guys did the hard work, and we were basically the entertainment. Um, but it's, it, it was certainly an eye-opener, and they're certainly very interesting and expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does sound like that, you know, to make all that happen. It is. Uh, luckily, you were in the uh, the decade of decadence, I suppose. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well. I, well. What, not not in Russia. Not not in Moscow. <laughs> no. There was there was no decadence in Moscow at that time. I certainly didn't see any. It was interesting hearing the other bands that you all were playing with over there because I, I guess you know, for them to have found their sound, it was like almost looking through a pinhole to get their influences. Yeah, I'm sure some of that came over on bootlegs and stuff, but, you know, it was um, kind of interesting yeah. to see how the music worked over there. And, and that's the other part, you know, how, how, how did those other bands get along with you all? I mean, uh, were, were you kind of accepted or, or was it sort of skeptical? I don't know, we, we, we met a couple of musicians in um, a called um, Gorky Park, and uh, they, uh, they were more um, sort of heavy rock than what we are, you know. I mean, we, we can be quite heavy as well, but those guys were more more into the, the heavy rock sort of things. You can tell them they've been listening to, you know, a lot of Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin and, you know, and then the up-to-date bands at the time, like your Bon Jovi's and Van Halen's and stuff there. So um, they were, I would say definitely more, more heavy rock than what we were. But, you know, here you are in a situation where you're not known 
much over there, if at all. Oh no, no, not at all. Yeah, not at all. And 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 you're representing this cultural thing while you're there. You couldn't crutch on any hits, you know. I mean, it was it had to have felt like, you know, that that bare slate. Like here's a room of you know however many people, and and they don't know any yeah, of these songs. No, we had a new band as far as um, the audience was concerned. They'd never, I don't think, had heard of any of our songs before, you know? I mean, that's, uh, that's got to be exciting to a point, though. You know, I hear a lot of bands that, you know, that just to, just to have to, to get that feeling of proving yourself again to make sure that you still got that. I don't know if you ever had that. Yeah, you still got, you still got to start again from scratch. Or be it, we were playing in a big, massive kind of arena. But, you know, you did have to start off. You, you know, you can't uh, be, be complacent about these things. You've got to really work what work, work hard, you know, if if it's not kind of happening, you know, out front of the audience have not heard your song, so you've got to go out and, you know, really perform them. Well I'll tie that back around to the record too. I, I know, you know, the album was already done in this time, but having a record called Peace in Our Time at this moment, at this time where you're doing something like this, I don't know, did it feel like it, the stars were kind of aligning to a point? Yeah, kind of, kind of, you know, it's, it was it's quite a big title piece in our time, you know, it's quite a heavy, heavy title to put on a record. It, it was just a, a very, it was a very strange year that, that year, you know, like I say, with the, visiting all these different countries and the tours and stuff, and it was, you know, a change of direction, and there was a kind of, a small backlash with some of the fans that didn't didn't get what we were doing, you know, and I, I can see that point of view, you know, but, you know, you, we'd, we'd come off the back of three albums that had that sound and that style of songwriting that was more organic and more what Big Country were about to, to kind of change like that. But I think we had to change, you know, you can't just you can't just stay in that one area, you know. How quick did you feel like you knew how this album was going to be perceived, you know, like towards the next album when you get away from this again, you know, because this, this album seems like kind of an island in, in your discography in that way. Yes, it is very, very different. And I think the the next record as well was very different um, until we kind of got back on our feet again. You know, you, you have to experiment. You, you, you just can't stay in the same place. It might be safe to stay in the same place, but it gets a bit boring after a while. So, um, And I think as time goes on, you, you, you're... Your playing, your musicianship gets better, and your songwriting skills get get better, or you would hope they would get better. Um, so you, you just go down different avenues and explore things, you know. And some things work, and some things don't. Well, you're still doing that too. I mean, uh, really enjoyed the journey that came out in in 2013. You're in the studio now. Does that mean you're working on the next record? Is that what's the, sort of the plan right now? I mean, I'm working on a. My son Jamie and I, the Jamie plays in the band as well, and uh, we occasionally do um, albums together. You know, this will be a, uh, we did an album before called Another Anthem for the Damned, and we're working on a, a second album just now. It's just called Bruce and Jamie Watson, um, and we're collaborating with uh, an American chap called Tom Kerchival. So we're writing songs at the moment, uh, but we just brought an EP out online that came out yesterday. So we're working on more songs at the moment for, for uh, a new album. Well, oh, that's nice timing on the EP then. <laughs> I have to check that. Out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, we're just we're just doing, doing this uh, album, but it's it's a lengthy process. We were, we send files across to America, and Tom sends them back, and we you know vice versa, and then we just get to the point where it's that song's ready. So we've got, we've got three songs online just now. Do you want to do another record under the uh, the Big Country moniker at this point? Um, at the moment, it's it's kind of very difficult to do because everybody in the band's so busy. Um, and also, Jamie and I, we, we play with another band called The Skids, which Stuart Adamson was an original member of as well. Mm-hmm. So between The Skids and Big Country and doing the Bruce and Jamie stuff, it's, we're really quite busy. Um, and other guys in Big Country, they, they've also got other projects that they're doing. So it's it's there's, there's not enough days in the year to do what we want <laughs> at the moment, anyway. Well, I do enjoy keeping up with you, Bruce, and I thank you for uh, for oh, taking the God. time to jump back to 88 no, with no me here. Thank you very much, Kyle. All right, it's been a pleasure. Take care. Okay, I better get back in the studio and get my guitar back on. <laughs> All right, sounds good. We'll, we'll hear from you soon. Okay, buddy. All right, bye. Okay, thank you so much. for coming back you. And my thanks to Bruce Watson of Big Country for the talk there, 1988's Peace in Our Time. Uh, if you haven't already, please do hit the subscribe or follow button wherever you're listening from right now, whether it's uh, wherever you get your podcasts from, whether it's on YouTube or whether it's on Spotify now. After that, WFPK.org. That's where I do a show every Monday through Thursday from noon to 3 Eastern. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.
Consequence Podcast Network.